Decide between six ninety six or seven. So either doing both of y'all pick. 
Uh, five and eight. No. <laughs> Between the two, come on. Six ninety six, six ninety seven, or both. Ninety seven. Okay. We'll do ninety six next time. Then. you looking at my ugly mug. I care about showing you what the Bible has to say. Now, we we finished. Somebody said you need a step stool and eats. Was that somebody within a slap reach of you? Okay. All right. Well, well God bless you anyway. God, he got he got to fly and he got to be tall and I didn't, so that's okay. I, it, it, oh, I, that's why I asked it. I thought you were talking about him. <laughs> no, it's 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 fine. They're, they're not wrong, but we just that's all right. I, I, you, you'll learn better of it one of these days. Um, now we finished chapter five, but if you'll permit me to back up to verse thirteen, I just want to cover that again because it's beautiful. Yeah, Genesis and, is in here. Huh? Genesis is in here. Oh, <laughs> I got that. Okay. We're, uh, Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 is where we'll start. We're going to cover chapter 6 tonight, but I like to read into where we're at just to kind of remind us where we left off. Because uh, Joshua, Joshua. Or, or Yeshua, or Jesus, or however you want to pronounce that word. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, they're all the same word. They're just translated a little different. Uh, Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Did I, did I say something wrong back there? I just asked that was in the Old Testament. Well, I don't feel like being back here. I hope you don't mind. I just, that thing, that, <laughs> I was trying to hide my face from y'all, but I just decided I'd rather stand here. I don't have anything up there I need anyway. It's all, all I don't need no notes. It's all right there. Um, 
I want to show you something super cool. I find this stuff interesting. Some of you may not, but I find this stuff interesting. But I'm going to save it till the end, so i got to get through this, because I want to show you something neat from Scripture that applies to us today. A lot of people are all the time saying, well, what's the Old Testament got to do with us today? Well, I'll have you know, Jesus quoted the Old Testament frequently. If it wasn't important, he wouldn't have quoted that stuff. He wanted us to know it, and it applies. And it pointed to him all the way through it. There's not a portion of the Old Testament that in some way point to Jesus. I'll tell you something else that's interesting. You know, um, I don't think God's mentioned by name anywhere in the book of Esther. Neither is Christ. But there's such a beautiful picture of Jesus even in the book of Esther. So we'll, we'll talk about that another time. I didn't mean to get off on that. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Y'all have had to find time to find that. The Bible says it came to pass. I told y'all. That's throughout. 1,700 times in the King James it says it came to pass. I love that phrase. It came to pass <clears throat> when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Now we talked about this last week, so I don't want to read reteach re that, but just briefly I will say we believe this to be either a theophany or a Christophany, which means Christ or God himself appearing to man, which he did several times in the Old Testament, i.e. the burning bush, there's, there's other occasions where the Lord appeared. Um, whether you want to believe this is God himself or, 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 or a, a, a manifestation of God himself or a manifestation of Christ, I happen to believe this is Jesus. Okay. Um, it's interesting, a couple things. First of all, his sword's already in his hand. He's not there to talk. He's there to do business. Okay, sword's already in his hand. Number two, Joshua asked him a question. You with us or are you with them? And I thought a lot about that statement because when I was younger, I was ignorant enough to pray at football games. I would ask God to intervene <laughs> in the outcome of a game, which I used to wonder this. This is just how the young mind works when you're young. Uh, okay. I used to wonder... If they're praying the same prayer over there that I'm praying over here, who's God going to answer? I used to wonder silly stuff like that. You know, if I'm praying for my team to win and, and they're praying for their team to win, see, I played football. It wasn't just the Cowboys I prayed for, okay? Whatever team I was on. Uh, now, I still pray at football games, but I've changed the prayer. I don't care about who wins anymore. I pray for safety. I pray they have a good time. I pray that God's honored in everything we do, even if it's hitting somebody with a ball. Okay. So anyhow, I've changed my prayer. But there used to be a time when I thought God would take sides in something as silly as a football game. <laughs> I have learned, and this is what this is teaching, God doesn't take sides. He already has a side. Okay. You either get on His or you're against Him, but He don't take sides. He doesn't come along to your adversary and pick them over you, and He doesn't come along to you and pick you over them. He has a side, and if you get on it, we're all on the same team. If you don't get on it, then we're automatically opposed. Okay. So when he asks this question, I love the Lord's answer, and I know I covered this last week, but real quickly, when he asks this question, the Lord answered him with a simple no, <laughs> uh, it, it, which is funny to me. He said, are you, are you for us or for them? And he said, nope. That's a weird answer. <laughs> but that's why he answered that way, because he, he had it all wrong. As captain of the host of the Lord am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. I said to him, What said my Lord unto his servant? I believe that's the evidence I need to believe this is Christ. Because if it had been an angel, the angel would have corrected him. Hey, I'm a servant of God too. Don't worship me. There's several times in Scripture where that's found. So you can take my word for it or not. But uh, typically if it was not God himself in some manner... Um, something else that's interesting. It, when, when, when Moses was at the burning bush and he fell on his face when he realized it was God, another thing that signifies it's the Lord is Moses was told to take his shoes off. He was on holy ground. The same thing happens here in verse 15. And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, I wanted to read that in the chapter 6 because... When Joshua was given instruction here in chapter 6, I believe these instructions were given during that passage. This is when the Lord told Joshua what he wanted them to do. The chapter divisions confused people, but you have to remember, those weren't there when the Bible was written. Those were added later. Now, I like that they're there. It helps me find where I need to be, and, and the Lord worked it out. Uh, that's why there's 66 books in Isaiah. I love that. 
<clears throat> but, the, but the chapter divisions weren't there. So keep this in mind. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. They had closed up their gates and nobody went in or out. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof and the mighty men of valor. And you shall come past the city, all ye men of war. Go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. So it's pretty clear. He told them, You march toward that city. You march around it one time. You're going to see in a minute that we're not permitted to make any noise. Very quietly, just march around the city and go back to camp. One time for six days, okay? Now these instructions, again, I believe these were given in the previous chapter, but this is when we're reading, okay? <clears throat> Verse 4, And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day ye shall come past the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with trumpets. You don't blow trumpets till the seventh day on the seventh trip around, okay? The first six days you go around it once. The seventh day you go around it seven times. And at the seventh time, that's when you blow the trumpets. So, he says in verse 5, It shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with a ram's horn, this is a chauffeur from the don't know, that's not a driver of a car either, that's a ram's horn. It's literally what it is. Just, just thought I'd clear that up. Shofar is, I think, is how they say it. But, you know, just, just to clear that up, I'm not talking about one of them fancy dress people who drive women. I'm talking about <laughs> Ram's horn. Okay, thank you for laughing at my jokes. Moving on. <laughs> it came to pass that when they may make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Now, this is pretty interesting. There's going to be a whole lot of noise made. And there's going to be all this shouting. And then the walls are going to fall down flat. And the people are going to send up every man straight before him. So it's pretty interesting stuff. We're going to cover some of this in a minute. But I want, I want to read on for now. Verse 6. Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant. And let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. Anybody know why we're using so many sevens? It is a number of completion. It's a number that represents the perfection and the holiness of God. Also, it reminds people of creation. Um, something that I didn't get deep into because I don't like studying idolatry. But my understanding is the Canaanites worshipped not only the sun of God, but also the moon God. In fact, the city of Jericho was named Jericho because the word Jericho means moon city. It's possible this was done to combat the teaching of the Canaanites of idolatry and some other form of creation. See, by teaching, and let me, let me be very clear. The devil's been pushing six on people for a long time. That's not just some random number that we see in Revelation. He's been pushing the number of man, humanism, what men can do. When you build a city with walls like Jericho had or like Babylon had, you're basically saying, look what we can do. When you build a tower like the, the, the like that, long before the Babylonians, by the way, it's not a coincidence that Babylon and Babylonian sounds the same. Okay? They worship the same idols. I'll share this with you just in passing. The idols haven't really changed. We talk about Tammuz, we talk about Molech, we talk about uh, Zeus and Jupiter and all these little g-gods. They're not really all different. They just keep getting their name changed. Did you know the Greek god Zeus is the same as the Roman god Jupiter? We named a planet after him. Mercury, I think, is Apollo. These are the same little g-gods they've been worshipping since Satan entered this place, okay? Since he started turning man against God. And they're still worshiping them today. Did you know we have a day named after the sun? Sunday. And a day named after the moon? Monday. Based on pagan idolatry. And every one of us uses Monday in a sentence. Every one of us uses Sunday in a sentence. We're not practicing paganists. We're not practicing idolaters. But we still use these terms. I'm not telling you to change the days of the week. I'm just telling you idolatry was a thing. So when the Lord does things like this in sevens, what He's saying as loud and clear as He can is, 
I created this place in seven days, six literal days of work, one day of rest, and I did it perfectly. And so when he does things like this, he's showing who he is, what he has done. He's reminding the people. And by the way, they knew. They knew better. To this day, I don't believe in atheists. Atheists say they don't believe in God. I don't believe in atheists. Because when you start talking about stuff with them, they believe more than they claim they believe. Okay? They just believe wrong. But anyhow, I, I, I'm getting way off track. Let, let them see something that there's surprises in and what comes out of their mouth. Oh, my, yes. <laughs> okay, you're right. Yes, that's not the only example, but that's a good one. Thank you for that. Okay, so the point I'm making here is the sevens mean something. And there's a whole lot of things that it means. We're going to get to something else about this at the end, but i, I, I got to move. So for now, let's move on. All right. <clears throat> Verse, uh, oh, um, the page must have turned. What in the world did I do? I was on verse 7, I think. Mm -hmm. And he said unto the people, Pass on and come past the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the ark of the Lord. It came to pass when Joshua had spoken to the people. That's what he had been instructed to do. Now he's telling them that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets, and the real reward came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. Now that's a reference to, that word real reward is an old word we don't use anymore, but it's just a reference to the contingent of men at the front and the contingent of men at the back that are armed, that are there to, uh, to signify God's army and the way that he's utilizing it to glorify himself. So verse 10. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice. Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. Then you shall shout. Now, think about this. And, and I'm going to use an illustration. Forgive me for this. I knew a very godly woman. I'm not going to tell you who she was because it's not about talking about her. It's just a point I'm making. But I did. I knew a very godly woman who, as far as I knew, had never uttered a cuss word her whole life. She was very godly, very active in her church, very good person, okay? One day, I aggravated her so bad. <laughs> Can you imagine me aggravating somebody? No. I, I just I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I had her so irritated that out of her mouth came a word I didn't know she knew. It wasn't real horrible, but it was something I didn't think she would ever say. And I was like, <laughs> I've never shut up so fast in my life. I, just, I was just dumbfounded, dumbstruck, whatever you call it, because when somebody who typically don't say those words says it, that gets your attention. See, I don't want to argue for or against curse words. We all know what the Bible says, but just understand, if you have to use those words, they're going to be so much more potent and powerful if you use them sparingly than if you're one of those that's every breath. Does anybody listen to those people? I mean, I don't know why some people talk like that. Some people do. It's every other word. Well, I know that's not exactly what this is talking about, but I can imagine the impact. If you walk around this city one time every day for six days, and you do it in dead silence, I mean, they're not even whispering because this says not a word. And if they were being obedient, then it's deathly quiet. Imagine being in Jericho, the moon city. And this army that you're already scared of, that's why you're locked in there, is walking around in complete silence. I don't even think they were looking up at them, pointing at them, giggling, or, 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 or threatening them, making threatening gestures. I think they were focused. I think they looked straight ahead and they just marched around that city. Can you imagine the impact that would have on you if you were there? Once a day, for six days, this huge army comes out. They walk around, and then they go back. Now, one day of that, you've got to be thinking, what are they doing? Two days of that, you've got to be thinking, this is strange. Normally, when an army come past a city, they were building battering rams, building ladders, making arrows, preparing for a battle or just a siege or whatever. They weren't doing any of that. They just walking around and going back. Walking around, going back. Six days they did this. Can you imagine what this was doing to the people in there after six days of that? Then on the seventh day, now I can just imagine this in my mind. It's funny to me. The seventh day, you're exposed. Here come the Israelites. They're going to do the same thing again. They're going to go around one time and go back. How many weeks are they going to do this? How many months are we going to watch them just march around and go back? Seventh day, they get a surprise. On the second trip around, wait a minute. <laughs> they're doing it again. This is new. 
Now they've got their attention. Wait a minute. There's a third time they're going around this thing. Four, five, still dead silence. Let's just say they had their attention. Nobody was asleep. Okay, Everybody was awake and aware of what was going on. All right. You've got the picture in your head. So <clears throat> Joshua told them, don't shout until they told the shout. Verse 11. So the ark of the Lord come past the city, going about it once. And then they came into the camp and lost in the camp. Verse 12. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them. But the river roar came after the ark of the Lord, and the priests going on and going with the trumpets. And the second day, they come past the city once and returned into the camp, and so they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day, they rose early about the dawning of the day, come past the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they come past the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time, when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. Now, if I understand this right, they were allowed to blow the trumpets at the beginning before they started marching and at the end when they ended. So the, the, the trumpets isn't, isn't what we're talking about here. The silence was there weren't supposed to be talking and whispering and joking around. But with the trumpets at the end, after they'd gone around, with the trumpets went this shout. And can you imagine, however many millions this is, shouting in unison together. And I'd love to know what they shouted. I don't know if it was just a yell, or if there was a word, if it was Jehovah God. I, I, just, I would love to know what they screamed out. But it doesn't make any difference. They shouted. Verse... Uh, 17 says, and the city shall be accursed. Don't miss this. Even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab, and we call her Rahab just because it's easier to say, but if you're pronouncing that properly, it's Rahab. Anyway, but the, the harlot shall live, she and all they that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye you make yourselves cursed, when you take the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Now, I don't want to get too deep into the accursed thing because we're going to cover that in the next chapter. Here's all you need to know about that. They were told what not to do. They were told what to do. And it was very specific. And God had a reason for it. When God makes rules, He does them with a purpose in mind. And we're supposed to do our, our best to follow those rules. Now, the law doesn't save us. We know that. We're still supposed to do what we're told. The Lord has a plan for us. We're supposed to try to live that plan out. So here they're told that this, uh, this city's cursed because of idolatry, and we're going to get to another reason later. And we'll talk about that accursed thing more later, so don't, 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 don't get mad at me. We're going to move on for now. Verse 18, You in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves accursed. When you take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel accursed, and trouble it. But all the silver, and the gold, and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Let me, let me make sure I make this clear. There was a lot of stuff in that city that one might find desirable. See, they had big flat screens, DVD players, they had cars and boats. All the stuff you'd want in the city, right? <laughs> Whatever the contemporary... Uh, uh, Equivalent was, that's what they had. Clothes, fine things, whatever they were. God's saying, I don't care if it has value or not. See, my wife wouldn't have been able to do this. My wife goes to a garage sale, anything of value, she wants to salvage it, keep it, donate it somewhere. She, she doesn't like to throw things away, and I understand that. But God said, everything in that city is cursed, with the only exception being these silver and gold um, things that he mentioned specifically. Those we consecrated to God, there it is. Everything else... Don't keep it. Don't have anything to do with it. Find some money in there or whatever. It's, it's not yours. It's, it's either cursed or it's God's. That's the only options given, okay? We'll cover that more in the next chapter, but I want you to see it, okay? Verse 20. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. I read somewhere that archaeologists have enough evidence to prove this happened that way. 
but they don't tell it to you. They've done enough excavations at that site to find that the foundations under the city where they've dug show something that corroborates this. Now, I don't know what it is because I don't know anything about architecture, but I can tell you I happen to believe they didn't crumble and fall. I believe they fell in on the people. I just think they fell like dominoes in on the people. Because I think all the people were huddled against them. And that was just the way the Lord chose to take them out. I, I don't know that. I wasn't there. doesn't say they crumbled. It says they fell down. When I imagine a wall falling down, it either fell in or it fell out. Well, the people were out here. God's people. The wicked idolaters are in there. So stands the reason they probably fell inward. I can't prove that to you. It's okay if you believe it happened another way. It's not important. That's just what I envision when I think about this. So we'll move on. But it says that the wall fell flat. That's in verse 20, okay? <clears throat> verse 21, And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city. Man, woman, young and old, ox, sheep, ass with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, bring out thence the woman and all that she hath, as you swore unto her. And the young men that were spies went in, and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother, and her brethren, and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. That means they got them out of harm's way, outside the camp. And then they burnt the city, verse 24, they burnt the city with fire, all that was therein. Only the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. At that time, that was the tabernacle. Now I want to pause there. We'll come back and pick up there. I want to pause there for a moment. And I want to show you something. And I hope you'll make this trip with me because this is what I was hoping to get to. Hold your place here in Joshua 6 and turn with me please to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. I want to show you something from the Old Testament, and I want to share with you something that applies to us today, okay? Leviticus chapter 23. I'm going to cover this kind of quick because y'all are smart people. I don't want to sound condescending. Y'all will follow this. Leviticus 23 and 1, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say to them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. Something I've tried hard to make clear to people is that these are not feasts of Israel. They are feasts of the Lord. They are important to the Lord all the time. Gentiles don't study this, but you should. Because all of these point to Jesus. They are very important. Now, I'm not telling you to celebrate them the way the Jews do. But you ought to be aware of them. And I'm fixing to show you one. <clears throat> Verse 5. In the fourteenth day of the first month at evening is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Unto the Lord seven days you must eat unleavened bread. I find it interesting that we crossed the Jordan on the tenth day of this same month. I told you all that. What did I tell you, class, that the crossing of the Jordan represents? Salvation. salvation. Not heaven, because you don't go to heaven and have to work. It's a picture of salvation, because when we get saved, there is a process for the believer. Okay? We're going to look at that in a minute. Just keep it in the back of your mind. Okay? I, I want to point that out to you. So on the 10th day, the, the, uh, the crossing of the Jordan takes place in the Joshua passage. But on the 10th day of the Passover week, they would select the Passover lamb. So just know that. 14th day, he would be uh, slaughtered. 15th day would be the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Just real quickly, keep in mind, they cross that river on the 10th day. When they get on the other side, the first thing they do is go and set up a memorial. Well, they put stones in the water. You could argue that's a picture of baptism. Salvation didn't have anything to do with stones in the water. The stones in the water are a picture of it. So if I'm right, 
There's a picture of salvation when you cross, a picture of baptism when you put the stones in. You with me? Okay, moving on. What's that? No, go ahead. I, I was always thought they took the stones from the water. They did both. They, on the land. they did. They did. <laughs> they took the stones out. Then they selected some and put them in the exact same spot they took them out of. So that the dirty ones come out. They're going, I mean, the ones in there were clean. They've been washed. They're set out there. The ones on the shore are dirty. They've not been washed. They're put in to be washed. Basically, they traded them. Picture of what we did when we got saved. And what we illustrate in baptism is the old dirty us going under the water and the new dirty us coming out. The old dirty rocks go into the river. The new clean rocks come out of the river. There's a picture there of salvation and baptism, which should happen consecutively. Should. Doesn't always, but should. Okay. I'm just showing it to you. We'll, we'll talk about it more in a moment. <clears throat> All right. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. According to the Joshua passage we studied a week or two ago, the manna they had been receiving ended when all this started. When they got across that river, they did not get any more manna. The bread stopped. I happen to believe it happened on the day of unleavened bread. But anyway, it, 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 was, it was right in there somewhere. So there's, 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 a, there's some uh, correlation there. That happens on the 15th day of the same month. <clears throat> also, as we studied in the Joshua passage, they had to circumcise the men after they crossed the river. We talk about that more later. We covered it the other day. They're supposed to eat unleavened bread for seven days. Y'all see that in the end of verse 6? In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you eat that for seven days. I happen to believe that for those seven days that they were marching around Jericho, they were eating unleavened bread. Remember, they are illustrating the holiness and righteousness of God. So they don't want to eat anything with yeast in it because yeast is a picture of what? Sin. This is why we use grape juice instead of wine because fermentation is a representation of sin. I don't know where in the world people got the idea you can use wine. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere. It says fruit of the vine or the cup. It doesn't say wine anywhere in the Lord's Supper. It says it in other places, but in every illustration of the Lord's Supper, it does not say wine anywhere in the King James. Every time it either says the cup or the fruit of the vine. Where in the world they think that's supposed to be alcoholic, but it wouldn't make sense. Because we're using unleavened bread, you should use unfermented juice. Agreed? Fermentation is caused by the same process that yeast makes bread uh, rise or whatever. Anyway, I'm not a scientist, but... We did study that in, in, in chemistry when I was in high school. So uh, I studied it. I just can't. I can't explain it. Anyhow, verse seven of Leviticus twenty-three: In the first day, you shall have a holy congregation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day, as a holy convocation, you shall do no servile work therein. The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say to them. When you be coming to the land which I give unto you, now, keep in mind, this passage is before they came into the land. In Joshua, they're in the land. So this passage applies to the people that are with Joshua that we're going to look at in a minute, okay? Tell the children of Israel that when you come into the land which I give unto you, then shall you bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. And he shall wave the sheep before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave. What day is the morrow after the Sabbath, class? Somebody said it earlier. Sunday. Sunday. If the Sabbath in the Old Testament was Saturday, then the morrow after would be Sunday. What day did Jesus come out of the grave? Sunday. Sunday. Okay. That's the day that as he rose, he became the first fruits of the resurrection. So that his children who accept his blood, his salvation, could also be resurrected. He's the first fruits, and we're, I guess, the after fruits. I don't know what you call us. But anyway, he was the first fruits of the resurrection. He, in himself, he fulfilled this particular feast, okay? Now, just real quickly, Jesus himself is the Passover lamb. Jesus himself 
is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus himself is the first fruits. And uh, I'll cover one more and then we're going to move on, okay? <clears throat> we left off in verse 12. After we read, Morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. You shall offer that day when you wave the sheep and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering to the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil. Skip down to, uh, this is about the meals and I don't want to cover that. Look down to verse 15. And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, we agreed that Sunday, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. How many weeks is seven Sabbaths? Seven. How many days is that? 49. Very good. So if you're counting that first day plus 49, that's 50 days. Very good. Okay. Even under the morrow, verse 16, even Sabbath shall be, shall you number 50 days. It literally says 50 days here. Many people today think Pentecost was just something that happened the year they crucified Christ. That's not true. Pentecost was around a long time ago. Christ fulfilled it the year they crucified. He fulfilled it because on that day, He provided us the Comforter. The Holy Spirit was poured out on the church on the day of Pentecost that same year. So, having covered all that, go back to Joshua, please. And I'll tile this in and we'll go on. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 6. When I look at the life of the Christian, I notice some things. We should know, and the Jews should have known, because it's in here. Crossing the river is a picture of salvation. I think the stones are a picture of baptism. I think when they were set up there at Gilgal, that's a picture of Christian fellowship where they all come together. After a Christian gets saved, they ought to get baptized. That's the first thing the Lord told you to do. Go, spread the gospel. Baptize people. The first thing he told us to do is baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. After a person has received Christ as their Savior, follow him in believer's baptism, they're supposed to gather with other Christians in a church somewhere, join up and contribute to a church somewhere. Now, why is that important? Anybody? Well, there is a host of reasons. But number one, if you're talking about a newborn baby, they cannot be born out of the womb and then placed somewhere on the doorstep and left to fend for themselves. They must be nurtured, cared for, loved. And I'm not just talking about feeding and watering. I'm talking about they've got to be hugged and held and comforted and protected. Well, the Christian is no different. When you get saved, you're born again, according to my Bible. You are a brand new baby in Christ. You may know lots of Bible, but you haven't learned yet how it applies. Some people study the Bible and don't understand it. Then they get saved, it begins to make sense. So you've got to get into a body of believers somewhere where you can grow. And not only fed and watered, because there's lots of churches who will teach you, but they don't nurture you. They don't hold you. They don't help you through anything. I was talking to a lady today who's uh, as part of this funeral I'm fixing to do. She said, you know, it's so sad. After my mom got where she couldn't go to church anymore, Nobody from that church ever came out to see her or call her. They were in check on her. That happens a lot. I'm thankful for this church where I know a number of you get out and talk to folks and visit them. I do too, but I don't catch everybody. And I appreciate a church that helps me in that. Anyhow, nurturing and taking care of and discipling young Christians is our duty. It's something we're supposed to do. You're going to see that in the Joshua passage in a minute. After you've done that, after you've joined the church, and you start growing, what is one of the next things you start learning to do as a Christian? Anybody? Give. Yeah. Study. Anything else? Yeah. Give. Tithing is important. Okay. These are all exemplified in the Joshua passage. Because if I'm right, the rocks picture baptism. And then they set up a memorial at Gilgal. And they gathered there. You don't have to call it church, but they gathered there for that purpose to honor and worship God. Then they went together to do what God told them to do. There's a picture of God appearing to Joshua in the form of Christophany, in, in the form of Christ, giving him direction. When you come into church, God gives you direction. He teaches you, He guides you, He leads you. So there's that picture I showed you. And then after that, they go and they obey the Lord and they come past that city and they're told, everything in that city is mine. It's 
mine. I get the first fruits. That's why we read the feasts. He gets the first fruits. Now, please understand, normally, when a city fell, normally, you get the booty. That's just the way that it goes. The, the, the soldiers would be permitted to take away the spoils of war. That was done throughout history, even God's people. And throughout the rest of the book of Joshua, they take the spoil. There's no problem with spoil. There's a problem with this spoil. God said this first city's mine for a couple of reasons. Number one, I want to show you a couple more things and I'm through. Number, another, another thing that happens when you're a young Christian just starting out in church, and you may realize this in your own life if you think about it. I remember it in mine. When I first got saved, it seemed as though God answered every prayer. It seemed as though He was so close to me all the time. And He was. As a baby Christian, it's as though He was right next to me. And I'd pray and I just felt the power of God on me. As I grew in my Christianity, I started to notice He didn't really leave me, but He allowed me to walk a little, just like we do with our kids. He allowed me to grow a little. And He didn't hold on quite so tight to me. We do the same thing with our babies. When they first start trying to crawl and, and walk, we'll help them. We'll hold both hands. We'll make sure they don't hit anything. And as they get stronger and better at it, we'll take our hand off of them a little bit. We're still there. We still love them. But it's a form of protection. You know, the same thing happened at, at Jericho. When they got to Jericho, God did it all. He brought down the walls. He killed the majority of the fighting men when the walls fell. There wasn't a whole lot that the Jews had to do. And because God did it all, he deserved the first fruits of that entire conquest. And all the people have to do is honor Him with what He's given them. That's still the picture today. God has given you everything you've got. It used to bug me, but people will get their paychecks. And I'll say, let's see, my, my, my insurance came out. Uh, taxes came out right off the top. Insurance came out. My retirement came out. Uh, this this, this you know, uniforms that, that came out. This is all I received. Well, I guess I'll give God His part of that. That used to bug me to death. Because that's not how it's supposed to work. God better get His before Uncle Sam gets His. God better get His before retirement plan gets theirs. God better get His before the medical people get theirs. Because God gets the first fruits, not what's left over. I had that on the sign for a while. Give God what is right, not what is left. You know, there's a lot of people today who don't know that. and There's a lot of people not teaching this church has been good about it, but I'm just telling you, that principle was taught all the way back at Jericho. When you give God first fruits, when you make sure He's number one, numero uno in your life, you would not believe how He'll bless you, take care of you, and provide for you. He don't need the money. What He wants is to see you trust Him. What He wants is to see you rely on Him. What He wants is to build a relationship with you that you will nurture to the point to where you can live a life that glorifies Him and trust Him to help you through it. So we see that there. And going back to Joshua 6 and 25, where we left off, we're going to finish the chapter. Any questions on any of that? All of that was a picture in the Old Testament of what Christians do today. You get saved, you get baptized, you get in a church somewhere, you'll, you'll learn about the Lord's Supper, you can partake of that at that point. Uh, by the way, that's illustrated in there too. I didn't get to that. Then you'll learn how to be obedient, to go out with the church, do things that are church sanctioned, good and godly things, and you'll learn to give. You'll learn that God gets first. And there's more in the next chapter, but moving on. Chapter 6, verse 25. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive, and her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwelt in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Not only did she move in with Israel, she is one of the, uh, the great, 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 great grandmothers of Jesus Christ. Did y'all know that? Yep. She is in the direct lineage of Christ. This was a prostitute. There's a picture there, too. It had nothing to do with how wicked and sinful those people were in and of themselves. Rahab was wicked, too. It had everything to do with accepting God as Savior. The same way it is today. It's got nothing to do with being good. I told them that at Andy Schwartz's funeral. I said, I didn't know Andy. I don't know if he was saved or not, but here's what I know. It doesn't matter how good you've been. It matters whether you've ever accepted Christ. That's been a picture throughout all of Scripture. 
So Rahab is saved alive, not because she's good. Very obviously, she was a prostitute. She was not good in her flesh. But she chose God. When given a choice between her people and the people of the Lord, she chose the Lord. She chose correctly. Her and her father's household and all that she had, and they dwell in, uh, dwell in Israel. Verse 26, And Joshua adjured them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his youngest son shall be set up the gates of it. Now, this comes to pass in 1 Kings 16, but just know that they were warned. And the reason God didn't want Jericho rebuilt is because the whole time it was there, it was a picture of wickedness and idolatry. Is a picture of people who did not love God. It was so wicked, the only people saved out of it was one household. Just one. Remind you of any place? Because I think of Sodom and Gomorrah. Right <clears throat> and I'm beginning to see it in America, if I'm being honest. We're not down to one household yet, but it sure feels that way some days. Um, some idiot does eventually build that city again. And that scripture is fulfilled later. But we're going to close with verse 27. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. Don't misunderstand that. His fame here, a lot of people think that's talking about Joshua. It's not talking about Joshua. You know who was famous throughout all of this? People feared God because they saw what he did with Moses. They see now what he does with Joshua. And all throughout David's time, they saw the things that God did. They were scared of God's people when they knew that the people were walking with God. And I'm going to say this. The devil ought to tremble when the Christians are walking with the Lord. Let me share something with you most people don't know. I think it's Matthew 16, 18. It says, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. A lot of people misunderstand that passage. Let me turn there. You know, I, I hate to go over, but give me a second. I want to share this with you because it goes along with it. Many people misunderstand this passage. And this will comfort your heart. It's a good place to close. I think it's Matthew 16, 18. If I'm wrong, y'all three. <clears throat> I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, he's not talking about Peter, he's talking about himself. Same thing, that's what made me think of it. Talking about Joshua and his fame. He wasn't talking about Joshua. And here this isn't talking about Peter. A lot of people make that mistake. He's not talking about Peter. He's talking about himself. Upon this rock. Remember Jesus is talking. Upon this rock. Me. I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. People read that and think well. We're safe in here. Because the gates of hell can't prevail against us. Because the Lord promised it. You know that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. When's the last time an Ari took their gates with them? When's the last time an invading army took the gates and brought them with them to fight you? That's not teaching that the Christian's safe in here from the devil out there. It's teaching that when you go charging the gates of hell, the gates of hell can't stop you. The Christian is a soldier of the cross carrying the gospel and a sword. We're supposed to go out and tell people, Jude said, to pull them out so that even the smell of fire won't get on them. That was about soul winning. That whole passage was about soul winning. It was about telling people about Jesus. That's what it was about. I'll read it again. You tell me if I'm wrong. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That means they have no defense doesn't mean we're safe from their offense. It means they have no defense. Their gates can't stop the church from winning souls to Christ. That's what that whole passage was teaching. And the gates of Jericho didn't help it either. Did anybody see the Jericho people with the gates headed out to fight Israel? No. They're on the defense. God's people are on the offense. That's not taught enough. People don't hear that enough. Yes, sir? Yes, yeah, so another picture of Jesus Christ going down to hell and coming back up. Well, we don't have time to get into that, but you're right. He, did, he does have the, key, the keys to death and hell. He went and got it. But we'll cover that another time. Good point. Anybody else have anything else before we close in prayer? I wanted to end with that because I want you to remember. We don't have to huddle anywhere and hide. 
You don't have to fear anything when you belong to the Lord. When you're walking with Him and you're on His side, you're not on yours, you're on His side, the gates of hell ought to tremble at your presence. Not because of who you are, but because of who you have with you. I'll, I'll liken it to one other illustration. I'm done. There's a story in the Bible where the Assyrian army, this is in 1 Kings 5 or 6, but the, uh, the, the Syrian army, not the Assyrian, the Syrian army is out there surrounding this little bitty hut that Elijah's in. It's either Elijah or Elijah. It's Elijah, I'm pretty sure. I get Elijah and Elisha mixed up. I think it's Elijah, but it could have been Elisha. Anyway, doesn't matter. <clears throat> They're in this little, it is Elisha, excuse me. Elisha's in there with a the servant. And the servant looks out and he sees that army and he's scared to death. Oh, no, there's our army. And remember what Elisha tells him? They that be with us is more than they that be with them. Because God had revealed to Elisha what I'm trying to tell you now. There is a host of angels. If you're in God's will doing what God calls you to do, there's nothing can hurt you. You can't die until God's ready for you to go. If He's the giver of life and death, you don't have anything to fear. That's why I never worried one second about COVID. Because I, if, if I stay in the will of God, I'm invincible until God's through with me. I cannot die until He wants me to. Paul is an example of that. They threw rocks at him and he got up. God wasn't done with him. When God was done with him, Paul died. When God was done with Peter, Peter died. When God's done with Chad, Chad will die. Before that time, I don't have a thing to fear as long as I'm walking with the Lord. If anybody ought to be scared, it ought to be the devil. Now, if that don't encourage you, I'm out of ideas. Let's yeah. close with a word of prayer. Father God in heaven, thank you, thank you, thank you for giving us a peace that passes all understanding. For giving, giving us strength not found in flesh, Lord, but found in our faith in you. Thank you, Lord, for giving us a measure of faith. We ask that you strengthen it, that you help us to grow in it, to live by it, and to trust you for it. And Lord, I pray that as we grow day by day, we will grow closer to you as the psalm says, nearer to you, dear God, nearer to you. Lord, I need you every hour. I need you every moment. And I thank you for your presence. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the privilege to stand here and teach your word. I pray, Lord, that it would sink deep into our hearts and we would leave this place encouraged, ready to do your will, and honor you with our lives. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.